Texas into the United States because Texas was not in the Union. We were a republic right. until both right. came along. Right, right, right. Yeah. Dad, can you tell us about, because uh, you said you know those Hank Williams Sr. songs by heart from when you were a, a, a young'un. Oh my gosh. Come on. <laughs> I love those stories. Oh, well, actually. You we were a teenager. Yeah, well, actually younger than that, probably about uh, maybe mm, 11, mm -hmm. uh, 10 or 11, because we went on the radio at 12 years old. Wow. And it was a, a radio station in Independence, Missouri. It's called KIMO. we had a remote show which was really cool because we went into this movie theater and the kids from schools came in oh. and we were you know kind of an no. attraction for the high school and, and grade school yeah. so we did the remote was up on a little stage there and they had the radio uh, set up through a remote system some way and then, but we had four radio shows a week at uh, probably between 12 and 15 years old I guess mm. and <laughs> We first went in and only knew about nine or ten songs. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd have to practice till midnight, you know, every, trying to get these songs together to go, because there was no, you did not put sheet music in front of you in those days. Oh. Everything was memorized. Yeah, wow. But it was kind of cool because in the fifth and sixth grade, you know, the teachers and the music teachers, they kind of enjoyed us. And, yeah. Ever in dreams with you, I'll stay dear to the wall. You saved for me Ever in dreams While I'm awaiting I'll hear this melody Whisper goodbye And gently say That in all the day Remember some of those songs, what they were? Yeah, maybe. Let's see. I think uh, probably the Hank Williams songs came later, but we did. Uh, uh, I was thinking of uh, uh, Cheating Heart, but Cheating Heart and uh, Setting the Woods on Fire was a Hank Williams song. And uh, gosh, there were so many. Uh, Tex sang uh, the Yodin song, uh, uh, Love Sick Blues. Oh, I love that. And he really did a good job on that. But we did most all Hank Williams songs, a few Tom, Hank Thompson songs. Uh, you guys, ended you're up working with really later, didn't you? Yeah, this, is, this goes back, uh, what, 65 years, 68 years? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Come on, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Not far. <laughs> well, the computer's still working pretty good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Time on you and Texas, and you put the twinkle in God's eyes when He.
calls me home, I'll be with you in Texas. Makes no difference where I roam. If loving you is the way to go, I'll is my home. Yes. Don't tell him that. <laughs> there was a. It was. It wasn't anything. It was. A, it wasn't a Hank Williams song, but it was one called the Blackberry Boogie. <laughs> and uh, Tex sang. I didn't really sing. We just had some backfill on it. And uh, the lyrics that were prohibited by the radio station because we sang it one time. And I don't know whether somebody called in or not. But all it was is uh, uh, Blackberry Boogie. I love the feel of that. Something like that. It's a blackberry boogie. I love the feel of that. Well, I meet her in the middle and she hollers, old oh, brother. And it was that part there that they did not like. It was a blackberry bush, not her. And they took it the wrong way. And the radio said that was the end of that song. Blackberry boogie no longer existed. <laughs> That was 1951 or three oh. or something. I was there know. a lot of censorship on the radio then? I guess I so. Think so. Yeah. More, yeah. Oh more my than, gosh. More you did not. You did not cuss. You did not even say the word damn. Right. Nothing. Yeah. They wanted to let the uh, owner and the announcer know, first of all, that we were uh, illegal. We, we were illegal on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, what was not the FFA, but what they called it back then, the federal something or other. Anyway, then they had a sergeant of arms that came with him, came down there, and they said, these boys are going to have to join the union or we're going to have to pull the radio show. Oh. And. Uh, they wanted us to stay on. We were on, I think, for about three years, off and on, pretty much on. And uh, anyway, the next day, the announcer says, you boys are going to have to go down to the Union. I've made an appointment for you. Get your mother. And so we took off school. We got to get out of school. <laughs> I think we were in the seventh or eighth grade. And Mom went down with us to the Union, and we thought, oh, God, we're going to have to take these tests and everything. I was the only one that could barely read, sight read a few notes. Tex didn't want to, and Roger was learning. He was doing pretty good. We thought if we have to take any music tests, we're never going to pass this. So they put us in front of Ted Dreher, the president at that time, which I later played music with him. He was a school musician, by the way. But that was an interesting experience, and we got in there and we thought uh, we were going to have to take these music tests we'd heard about, you know, or perform for someone. And Mr. Dreher said, uh, 
well, we know you boys are already professionals. You're, you're making money on the, on the radio. He says, uh, I don't think it's necessary for you to take the music test. He says, $50 a piece for the, for the dues. So we didn't have to, and it was a good thing because I hadn't had gone to the conservatory yet. I hadn't play, had to stop studying. And uh, I don't know what, I never, we never knew what the test was going to be. Never did understand it. My daughter from London, England was here, and she was on Broadway and Cats and all that stuff. We were real glad to have her. We was wondering if she might come up and sing a song oh, if you put your hands and feet together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So then the, you, go, you got picked up from that radio show to go do something, didn't you? Yeah, that's where I went to play with, unbelievably, the Merle Travis show. And Merle Travis at that time was like a rock star. He'd come off of a movie called um, From Here to Eternity with Frank Sinatra and some of those big stars. At that time, it was 19, that was 1953, From Here to Eternity. And Merle had just come off of that show. and he had saying you'd still see it probably google it i guess mm -hmm. it's uh, on youtube youtube probably but he'd sang reenlistment blues was one of the you know talking about the soldiers world war ii and so on but he played guitar in there and i was lucky enough through my mentor my teach one of the teachers i had was don winsell and he died in in his 30s mm -hmm. i lost him as a great friend a great teacher man i, I miss that guy but he was he was responsible for, in a way for me getting the to go on the road with those folks and Maggie, that was called the Maggie and Scotty Show. And they were quite well to do. They'd done Nashville and I don't know if they were on the old Opry or not, but anyway, I did the 90, what they called the 90 Day Wonder Tour because they had to do with the military. And, and so Merle Travis was there. And that was an experience I'll never forget. Phil Spurbeck was on steel guitar and he knew Rex Allen, his folks knew some of those old movie stars and uh, anyway Phil says I want to introduce you to Merle so we walked up these steps and we're getting ready to rehearse the show was down uh, the rehearsal room was downstairs and it was at uh, Eau Claire Wisconsin television station in Eau Claire Wisconsin 16 years old I drove my 51 Ford up there oh dude <laughs> <laughs> what color it was black four door oh man I bet she was hot and happening <laughs> well, yeah, it was quite an experience, and I, I couldn't believe I was doing it. And then I was going to be paid, I think I got $90 a week on that That's show. That's a lot that of money 1953. That was a lot of money. Wow. It was more than my stepdad was making as a pharmacist. I think he made 65 or 70 Oh, my that. gosh. But uh, anyway, to meet Merle was a, a bit scary, i got to tell you the truth. 16-year-old kid, here's this huge star. And knocked on the door, and there's Merle Travis on the door. And Opened it up and Phil says, uh, Merle, I want you to meet the lead player for the show. And I said, Jimmy King. He said, No, they had a tub of beer, <laughs> a wash tub. <laughs> Sitting over there, and the guitar popped up there. Come on in. And he said, They talked and chatted a little bit and stuff. And he said, uh, I hear you're going to be the lead player on this show, boy. I said, Yes, sir. He said, uh, Well, why don't you play something for me? Oh, boy. <laughs> what am I going to play for Merle <laughs> Travis? Great thumb pick. If you, if you go on, you Google and listen to what he's, he did back then, still today. Great thumb pick and great style, good singer. Anyway, so I picked up the guitar and had Merle Travis across just like, and that's the one they used in the, from the movie From Here to Eternity. I got to play on it. It had a little split in the back of it, I remember. But, you know, they use those guitars so much. But anyway, I couldn't think of anything to play country. I'd been studying with another guitar player who taught me Moonlight in Vermont okay. by a guitar player by the name of Johnny Smith. And I got it note for note from this teacher. Man, it just 
came, I started playing it, you know. I played it all the way through. I didn't miss anything, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was intricate. I mean, it had some beautiful jazz chords and things in it. And he, I didn't hear anything for a few minutes. Played the whole song? <laughs> played the whole song. We just, and uh, Phil was drinking a beer. We were both underage. He was at about 19, I guess. He said, can he drink a beer? <laughs> so I think you'll do all right, boy. I, I didn't take the beer at that time. But that's how we got started. We had, uh, I played a whole different style. I played single note lead, and then I did, uh, he asked me to do uh, uh, rock and roll songs at that time, which was uh, one that they picked out uh, called I'm Walking by Fats Domino. It was a black and I'm walking. Yes, indeed, and I'm talking about you and me, and I'm walking. And that one, was, that was my part of the show, other than backfilling, you know. But uh, yeah, those were the days. But uh, it, I was so blessed to be in it. I mean, I just I look back on in the wonderful players like right here. There's some wonderful players right here, Western Swing. That these fellows have got backgrounds like that as well, mm. and they're. Uh, some of these fellows are multi-talented down here. They played, and still play, a lot of instruments. bought our clothes at a western wear store in uh, downtown Kansas City, Missouri, called Copeland's, C-O-P-L-E-L-A-N-D-S, and they had uh, like uh, farmer's clothes and working britches and stuff like that, but they also had western wear like something like this, and so we, when we started making money, we could go down there Oh, yeah, we thought we were really something. We bought these western shirts. Of course, pants were, we had to wear western pants with the flap like this, you know. And boots, we bought a lot of boots. <laughs> boots with rhinestones in a couple of pairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you still maybe have one or two pair of boots in your closet, don't you? Uh, yeah. We had one time over uh, yeah. 70 pairs. <laughs> 70? 70. Yeah. 70 some, yeah. Yeah, but uh, we donated some of those to other musicians that didn't have them. <laughs> back to uh, that tour we took two years ago <coughs> and the show was actually called the Hank Williams Senior Show. Senior Show. It had another title but they leased my bus and uh, 
which was a Silver Eagle 16 sleeper. It had, you saw it. Hmm. It had front and rear galleys. She traveled and slept in it. It was great. It had uh, beds in the back. Beautiful bus. Yeah. It painted uh, with the Lexon silver. Donna Fay had designed it and all that. So anyway, uh, the fellow that was portraying Hank Williams Sr. was, uh, had chosen our bus. And there's a lot of buses in Nashville, Tennessee, but he chose ours clear down in Texas. He had to pay all that surcharge oh. to have, it, have us bring it up to Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> but he was getting a driver, a bus, and, and a... And a bass player. He's got three. He got, three and one. Yeah, got, not many people well, offer that. <laughs> he got a guitar player and bass player and a driver and a bus. Not to mention a sense of humor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that comes yeah. for free of charge. No, that, that, was extra, that wasn't extra, but uh, <laughs> we... Uh, we, we agreed to, we, yeah. and he gave us a good contract, we had a good deal on it, but getting to the point, we, we had a long tour, in fact I've still got a t-shirt with all the, he had every one of the cities and towns, the whole back of the t-shirt was filled up, I think it was 17 or 19. No, we had eight. Was it only eight or nine? There was only eight. Eight what? Thanks. Eight. But Buddy, oh that's right, Buddy's band was 19, okay I get it straight. Oh, people. No, no eight, sh eight shows, shows in different states, shows, right. and we had it was over 3,700 <coughs> miles, I think, wasn't it? And uh, the bus was turned on; the diesel never stopped, 24/7. And we had uh, when we first started out, we had nine band members on it, and uh, like I said, we left Monte Alto, played Nashville, back, back to, to Gaines. No, we backtracked Arkansas. to Arkansas, then we went to Tennessee, and then we went to Gainesville. Gainesville is where uh, Randy Travis lives, that's his home. But he had already had the stroke mm -hmm. earlier, like two or three months earlier, I think it was, or longer maybe. Even. Even longer. But he was in the hospital in Nashville, and they didn't think he was going to live. And they, the doctors recommended that they take off the uh, life-saving devices. This is Randy Travis. Randy mm -hmm. Travis. And uh, his girlfriend at that time, Mary, wasn't convinced that they should do that right away. So she went down to the chapel, prayed, and came back up. And of course, he was lying there lifeless. And she looked down at him and says, Randy, if there's any way you can give me a sign that there's hope. And uh, I get emotional over this still. <laughs> Wow. And a tear came down, and he moved his finger. Yeah. And she said, "No, no way." Don't worry, they will not pull the plug. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And uh, so he was there at uh, Gainesville, Texas, and we expected, we heard he was going to come down and listen to our our part of the show, and uh, which are we were the, the the main show. We were the main attraction for that event. And he said, uh, if Mary said, uh, well, Randy's going to sit in the audience. And we thought he'd, they'd bring him right up in front. He sat back in the back, the very last row, with the rest of the people. He didn't want to sit with, with some of his neighbors. And later on, we, there, was a, there was a guitar giveaway that, uh, uh, not every show we did, but th this night they were going to give a guitar because Randy was there and to give it away to, uh, winner, ticket winner. And we all went back into the green room and uh, had a big table laid out and had a guitar on there and some stuff. But anyway, Randy got came back there and he just barely moved through there. And of course he was like a stroke. He was a stroke victim at that time, but he was walking, you know, that was a man, you know, that's amazing. And uh, anyway, we all band signed the guitars and we're standing around Randy and they took a picture or two. Somebody's in there, just a snapshot, I guess. But Mary, his wife, or to wife-to-be, said, Randy, can you sign the guitar? And he gets up there and he, she said, I don't think he can do it. He's only been able to sign his first name and then make a T. T. He couldn't sign Travis. And he kept going, he kept going. And he signed his full name. She said, my God, I've never seen him do that. But anyway, that was the, the miracle that we witnessed. Yeah. That he <coughs> survived. Right. He was he was they they were going they had him he was they were ready to let him die. The medical profession was ready to let him die. Yeah.
That's enough to give people an idea of what was going on. The Hank Williams, to answer those, we did just about every one that uh, Hank wrote. The mainstream, the popular ones that the audience requested. In those days, you really played what the audience wanted. You didn't get up and play your own thing like they do today to try to sell it. And that's okay. But we made our living by playing Cheat and Heart and the other ones that I named. And, uh, uh, Lovesick Blues. Half as much was another one that Hank had that we really liked out that he did. But he was an amazing, you look back on that, he died at uh, 29 years old and had written wow. all those songs in such a short length of time. But it seemed like there was an era there where the kids that I knew that played music, there was so much talent at those young ages. And he was one of those that was in that era, I guess, whatever you want to call it. And I think that was an amazing time. I was just glad to share some of it, you know, because it was so different. But we had opportunities that the young ones today don't have because we could take a record into a little old radio station about the size of this room and if maybe play it for the, the announcer. If he liked it, well, I'll see if I can play that for you. And if it went over, well, he, you know, he might get... Some of those stations were huge. I mean, they go in two or three states, so if they played your record back then, and you got a few calls in, he'd play it again, you know. So then maybe you get a chance to, you know, cut a deal with a big a major, you know. <laughs> been teaching Pianer? I'm on my 73rd year of teaching piano. What? Oh my gosh. And how many students you got now? Right now I have 17 and through the years for about 25 years I averaged 90 a week. And I love teaching every minute that I taught. I taught early in the morning all day long. What's your favorite thing about teaching or playing? The thing I love the most about teaching is seeing the progress. I have them from four years old to 92 through the years. And it is so rewarding when you teach them and then you see the accomplishment when they can play. I call them little pieces. I think they call them numbers now. But when you see them be able to play one and all the way through and with the proper expression, and it's just rewarding. I love my students. They are the love of my life. Yeah. 
and they have through the years been a very comfort to me and especially after my husband died mm -hmm. I still kept teaching the students were so sweet and it was something to do to fill the lonely hours and something I love to do and I still love to <laughs> trying to keep a tradition of music alive. I saw some youngins here last night playing, picking and a grinning, the, the boy, the brother and the sister. Did you see them? Yes, I did, and I'm so glad we have the new, younger ones coming up. We have several in our overall organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're so happy to have them carry on the Western swing. Yeah. Tears, so many I can't see. We had a grandfather by marriage, Uncle D, yeah. and uh, he had fiddles, he was a piano tuner, and he could bring in banjos, mandolins, and my mom played steel guitar. So I learned to play those a little bit. Yeah, I play on them somewhat, but not enough to really make a living with those. But And they faded away because every time I'd play one of those, they said, Sonny, get your guitar, we want you to play lead on this one. And that was uh, Uncle Joe and Uncle John, the fiddle player, and get to those. Uh, Those's the two Indian guys used to go over there on Friday nights? Was it? Yeah, they were, uh, they had some Indian in them, mm -hmm. yeah. And Uncle John, it was thought to be that, uh, he was a champion fiddle player, by the way. He won some state contests and everything, but Joe and I used to think that he was the one that came up with the old BS. Everybody in the country knew music knows what OBS means. What's that? Old Bull. Oh, what well, nice no. Now, <laughs> 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 Dad. No, it's the Orange Blossom Special. <laughs> <laughs> That's just an old saying we made up That's on the true. bandstand. Don't sit, don't repeat it. <laughs> but anyway, he he played this song called The Train. And every time he, we were like kids, you know. Uncle John played The Train. He, ooh, and get this thing. Faster, chuka, faster. Chuka, 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 chuka. And I'd play guitar with it a little bit, try to play with him. But that's, we believe that that's where uh, they came up with the Orange Blossom Special. Maybe through him or other fiddle players like him. Because it was fun to hear that fiddle sound like a train, you know, where they could move that bow. Always an audience pleaser. You know, they get that thing going. Yeah.
Well, can I just thank you for raising Vicki and I up on, and also getting to continue your passion of being a musician and you never stop working and you also managed to fit in some other money-making jobs enough to afford us a luxurious childhood and everything we could ever dream of and you really um, are, uh, deserve a lot of respect for that. Well, it, you, when I first had you and then Vicki came along, I was uh, it was very special because of uh, you know the life. Of course, I had four sisters, so I was used to being around females. I was the only boy <laughs> in the family. <laughs> and but a mother and a grandma. And a mother and grandma. The grandma really helped to raise me a lot. Nanny, her name was Nanny, but uh, Martha Ashley was her real name. But uh, when you came along, and then a quick story on you, and uh, she seemed to, from, I mean, almost an infant. Now this sounds crazy, like. The Randy Travis miracle story. Story. As soon as she could walk, she was kind of humming around, and she'd move these feet up and down like this to stand up on the edge of the couch. And I was taking care of. I was playing six nights a week at uh, the Chestnut Inn, Kansas City, Missouri. A very popular place. That's where the uh, country stars from Nashville came in. We were the house band for that. Frankie Reb and the Rebels. <laughs> the rock country. First one of the first country rock bands in that area, by the way. Anyway, I had to rehearse and practice every day because I, I was looking for a day job. And I worked at a factory. I worked at a Kramer chair for a while and played at night. But anyway, that I got to making more money in the music for a while. But she came along. It wasn't long before you were singing, I'll be down to get you in a taxi. And better be ready about half past eight. Now, honey, don't be late. Be there when the band starts playing. Remember when we get there, baby. Two steps, we're gonna, gonna have them all. Go dance off both of my shoes. When we play those belly roll blues. That's tomorrow night at the Dark Town Stutters Ball. Tomorrow night at the Dark Town Stutters Ball. <laughs> that was it, and she was barely two years old, I swear. There's a great drummer that was studying at the conservatory of music, Carl Webb, used to come by and he heard you singing one day and he looked down and he says, is that baby singing? <laughs> I said, she sure is. Amazing. 